Hey everyone, welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have two guests, Zach Conway and Adrian Grenier. Welcome to the show, guys. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. Tell us a bit about yourselves and also introduce yourself so that people who are just listening to the audio version can put a name to the voice since they can't see you like I can. So yeah, thanks, Robert. I am, uh, to sum it up, I'm a dad. So I'm a dad of two uh, daughters who are four and one years old. So they're, that's kind of most of my life is, is chasing after the kids and being a hopefully good husband. Um, you know, so that, that's, uh, that's most of my life. But on the work side, I'm a financial advisor by background. And I've actually sort of grown up in the business because uh, it's a family business. My dad has been an advisor for going on 40 years. So I've sort of seen over many years, um, you know, how he's built the business and how he works with clients. And I joined him in that business uh, almost 10 years ago at this point. And what I love about being in that business is about, you know, how much it, it's really about people. I think, you know, people think, for a financial advisor, it's about the dollars and cents. It's about the math. And it's really about understanding people and being a good listener and you know, shaping guidance around your understanding of, of who your clients really are. And so in that business, we were uh, and continue to be, you know, have that be the focus, right? Uh, being uh, really deeply understanding who a family is and, and what matters most to them. And that kind of came... Uh, you know, that comes in the form of really understanding who they are beyond the balance sheet, right? So we need to understand where the money is and how it's invested and how they're saving and what they're doing from a tax perspective and all of those sort of traditional things. But for us, it's, it's always about understanding who they are in all of the other areas of life, right? And we arguably spend more time talking about that than the dollars and cents. So you know, your health and your relationships, and you may be making a lot of money in what your job is. And that's great from a financial planning perspective, but do you actually find fulfillment in what you do for a living and sort of quantifying satisfaction in those areas and hopefully, you know, delivering the right support across those all, you know, all of those areas of life. And as part of that, you know, the conversation is often centered around values and understanding, you know, for families in particular, what kind of legacy do you want to create? What do you, how do you view the world? And, and you know, what do you want to empower your children to do? And, and, um, and, and what causes do you care about? And then create a plan around that. And historically in the business, you know, that comes in the form of your nonprofit giving and maybe impact investments that you make. And we were supporting that in the business. And we had this moment several years ago where we recognize this weird disconnection with what we were empowering those families to do with nonprofit giving that was clearly value centered um, and, you know, particular impact investments, and then their long-term stock and bond portfolio. And those two things or three things were arguably pointed in different directions. So we're helping to support you over here from a values perspective. We're sort of, you know, uh, pointed in the other direction and misaligned in the portfolio that we're delivering to you. So uh, in that business and, and working with my dad and working with these client relationships, understanding that we needed to fix that. How do we create alignment? After we understand who this family is, how do we make sure that all those sort of buckets are, of money are actually pointed in the right direction? So that uh, you know, has been my uh, sort of career arc to lead me to building this company Seeds to support ourselves as advisors and then hopefully other advisors in kind of solving that fundamental problem. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian Grenier. Y you may know me as an actor. I've been an actor for whew, two decades or so. Um, but what people don't may not know is that I'm, I've also been investing for about 15 years as well, um, casually for the, the, the most part, uh, until recently when I started working with my partner, Bob Manuzzi at Umana, and we started being more um, intentional about how we were investing and more um, 
a- active instead of passively receiving offers and opportunities, we were a- out there pursuing them. And we created Do Contra Ventures, uh, whose mission is to um, seek yields beyond money. So we want the, the, the deeper aspect of business. We want to make money, which we're doing quite well, if I may, but um, really looking for businesses and companies like Zach. And I think it was very apropos that Zach started his, 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 uh, his conversation with his kids. He was talking about his children. Uh, and that really is our approach is creating relationships, finding the depth and the importance of um, what we're actually trying to do in the world, not just make money, but we're trying to actually shape a, a world that, it, you know, our hearts know is possible. And so for us, it's about working really closely with founders and making sure that they align with our values. And that we're, we're really looking to, I mean, uh, do Contra and Seeds really work really well together because we both have the same mission, which is to redefine wealth and realign um, our money, the, the value we have in the bank with our values that we have in our hearts. So, um, it, we, we are very happy to invest and support um, Zach and the team and, and what they're doing, which is creating tools that empower uh, financial advisors to empower the people with money to actually do the, do the things that they want to do anyway. They just don't necessarily know how. And so that's that's the the relationship in a nutshell. And it's uh, it's been great so far. So. <laughs> I know a bit about both of your backgrounds individually, a lot of what you just told us, but I don't know how you guys met or even the full extent of what your relationship is today. So tell us a bit about how you two came to meet and what your relationship is like today. Yeah. So, so it's an interesting story, uh, but it's a simple story. I actually reached out to Adrian on LinkedIn. So we found each other on a you know social network platform and I was you know sort of one day thinking about building the business and obviously what we're trying to do in the world and, and how to empower, empower advisors. And Adrian's face popped up as I was scrolling through the platform. And he swiped right. Let it just, yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, he swiped right on me. <laughs> exactly. And you know, I saw his face. I'm like, man, this guy looks very, very familiar. How do I know this person? And then obviously, you know, realized who it was, but it was also a realization of, you know, I had a, a, I think, a general understanding of what Adrian was doing in the world beyond his his you know acting career, um, but seeing that more deeply in you know just uh, looking at the platform and what he's been up to, and uh, just having this realization very quickly, you know, as Adrian just pointed out, that there was very clear, exciting alignment with what we were doing, right? So obviously, Ducontra being in the venture space, thinking about values alignment from a venture perspective. And, you know, seeds uh, more from sort of a long-term diversified portfolio perspective, and just having a shared vision for, you know, if we can shift capital in these two different verticals in the same way at the same time, and, you know, obviously have nonprofit giving be sort of the third pillar to that, um, you know, there was a lot of alignment. So I was excited about that and yes, yeah, swiped right and we connected and uh, just sort of started the conversation and, and took it from there. And, and here we are. From your perspective, Adrian, I'm curious to hear why why did you even respond? Not even before we even get to why you invested, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Why'd you even respond? I know for me, I have a lot less, you know, quote unquote fame than you do, and I get tons of DMs. So I can only imagine that you have have tons coming. So what what did Zach say or do or like, overall what made it stand out and why'd you even respond? Well, uh, you know, people may, uh, this may come to a surprise, but I'm actually quite accessible, um, you know, not, not to give anyone listening any ideas, but also to give you ideas, I'm ready to work, um, you know, so I'm ready to meet people and work on um, my, my mission uh, with anyone who is aligned. So when I heard about what Zach was doing, it was like, oh yeah, of course, this is this. At, at, at first blush, it seemed like, yeah, this could be something interesting. And I'll be very honest, 
I'm not the business mind. I'm I'm the visionary uh, overall, but I have people working at DuContra that can really drill down into the business aspect and make sure that it is a viable uh, pursuit financially and that we're actually not going to lose our shirts on this, but we're actually going to do well because if we don't make money, we're, we're not going to be able to continue to do the good work we're, we're attempting to do. So at first it was all nicety. It's like, oh yeah, we want to make the world a better place. Sure, sure. But now let's drill down into the business aspect. And when we looked at the business, it was uh, undeniable uh, what a solid um, you know, business concept it, it, it was and how Zach and the team were approaching it and uh, their experience level and their and their commitment it's it wasn't just you know ESG for the sake of it you know to look good or to you know feel feel good about themselves they're, they're really actually quite adept at this kind of business as well as their hearts are in the right place and so it's all those metrics that we look at before we say yes for somebody that's listening to the show that's in a similar spot to Zach, who's trying to get in contact with somebody such as yourself, what can they do to stand out and maybe get the attention of, of people like you, whether it's investors or even potentially customers, what can people do to get people interested? You know, I, I respect everyone who's trying to start a business, you know, first and foremost, I mean, whether it's a values aligned business or not, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, but I think we need as much innovation as possible. We need a lot of people starting businesses, uh, not, not from, you know, the ego, just because they want to be a CEO, but, you know, people who have great ideas and actually want to make, make something in the world. So I, I support uh, all, all young entrepreneurs and business people alike. I've started businesses myself. I know how hard it is. So I respect that. Um, and then when it comes down to the, the things that I'm trying to do, you know, in mission alignment, I, I say, just reach out to me. That, that's fine. I, I'm happy to take a, a, a look at what you're doing, but, you know, I'll just say, I say no way more than I say yes. And that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, there are so many people, so many businesses, we can't say no to all of them, obviously. And in fact, we, we we're only going to say yes to about 30 companies in the next uh, couple of years. So we're being very, very, um, you know, uh, conservative in, in terms of, you know, and, and that gives us the ability to focus on the, on the, on the, on the companies and the entrepreneurs that um, we do make bets on. Uh, so feel free to reach out, feel free to uh, pitch, uh, but just know that it may not, it most likely will be a no. That's just the nature of it. <laughs> Zach, from your perspective, I know it was kind of happenstance or happen chance, but what did you do to make sure that your message was seen by Adrian? Did you do anything creative? Did you even give that any consideration? Or were you just kind of sending a, a random message and hoping that it got through? You know, I, I think I put some thought into it when I sat down and, and tried to think of the words I wanted to use and how I wanted to communicate uh, what we were trying to accomplish as a business. But I think, you know, the focus in what I wanted to communicate was that alignment, right? Sort of, even from a business model perspective, we're sort of on similar paths and certainly have a very clear kind of uh, North Star alignment in what we're trying to do in the world. So speaking to that, right? You know, here's, um, you will have a very viable and incredible venture platform through this lens, and we also think we're going to have an incredible, very viable business model around, you know, long-term diversified portfolio investing and financial advisors that sort of sit uh, in front of a lot of the wealth that exists across the country who are sort of desperately looking for uh, a solution as it relates to having a conversation around values and delivering the right portfolios. Um, so I think speaking to both of those things, right, sort of, hey, we have business model alignment, we're th we think of... Uh, what works in the same way. And obviously philosophically, you know, we're, we're right in parallel as well. And we're both young and we both have the same haircut. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a whole life that of work to do together. Exactly. I think that makes three of us. I think my hair is similar as well. <laughs> yeah. It's all the Wait. same. So what exactly is impact investing? You guys have mentioned impact investing, ESG. What exactly is it and why have you made it a focus of your both of your companies, the the investment company, Adrian, that you have, and then also Seeds, Zach? 
so I've, I've been doing environmental work for a long time. I've started at least two nonprofits. Um, so, I, you know, I've always come at life as wanting to help, wanting to be constructive and, and do something good in the world. Um, and it, it wasn't until recently that I realized at, at the end of the day, nonprofits are, are great. They, they do serve a purpose, but in a world that's run by money, the way to really make change is through money. And then I started looking at money. I read, um, you know, a couple books, one of them in particular by Charles Eisenstein called Sacred Economics. And I started to realize that we all have a baseline uh, education, condi- a conditioning of money. Uh, and and sometimes it, it's it's not that healthy. So I do believe that we need to look at our own relationship to, to wealth and value and money and 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 heal that on some level so that we so that we don't get distracted by the, the rat race trying to make money. So for us at Du Contra, we really want to redefine wealth and heal our relationship to money. And so we have a category that's the future of finance, uh, one of our verticals. And um, that is really to look at tools of equity and access and uh, and ways that people can have you know, more access to the tools that build the world, which is money, so that they can um, start to put them into action in the world and, and build the kind of businesses and build the kind of world that is aligned with their values. So um, that's, you know, that's where Seeds come, comes in, really. It, you know, they're perfectly aligned with that particular vertical. Um, so, yeah. And I, I would just add, you know, we think about terminology a lot sort of all the semantics that get thrown around as it relates to values in line investing. I think the term impact investing sort of stands out. I think people kind of know it best. And I think almost as a result of that, that's what they implement best to some extent, right? So you know what it means in the same way that you know what it means when you kind of give a dollar to a nonprofit and see the effect of that dollar. When you make an impact investment, you know, you're investing in a for-profit business, but that business hopefully has some sort of, you know, um, game plan beyond profit, right? What are they actually changing in the world in their very business model? And so in our business at the time, again, we were seeing families who were doing that, right? So they were kind of solving the nonprofit side and we were supporting that. They were solving the pure impact investing side and we were supporting that. But when you look at, you know, as Adrian said, then the long-term diversified portfolio, all the rest of the money was antithetical to that. So that's where we think of the term ESG integration, where you can still have sort of a, you know, a more traditional exposure to companies that we all know that are sort of household name companies and have a risk profile portfolio that's in alignment with your risk profile as an investor. That's arguably a little bit less risk than what you may be doing on the the impact investing side, uh, but have it be ESG integrated. So owning companies, you know, blue chip companies and a diversified portfolio where corporate behavior is not the opposite of what you're trying to do on the impact side. So making sure that you have this sort of baseline of values aligned in that long-term diversified portfolio by way of ESG integration, and then keep doing your impact investing, keep doing your nonprofit giving. I remember Adrian, I think on the first call, you know, us speaking for the first time, Adrian, you know, use the analogy with those sort of three buckets of, you know, we're driving with the parking brake because you're solving, you're trying to solve all these things over here, um, but your long-term, you know, your long-term portfolio again is doing the opposite. So that's what we want to fix. In, yeah. Did you have something you want to add, Adrian? Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, look, there are a lot of catchphrases that, you know, make their rounds, uh, you know, from time to time in each epoch, there's, you know, sustainability, regenerative impact, you know, ESG, all these, these terms. And a lot of times they can be vague, especially when we're talking about the intangible, (laughs) you know, a lot of times, um, you know, we understand zeros and ones, we can uh, measure them. We know money, we can calculate it. You know, you know how much you have in the bank, you know what it's worth. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's one of the benefits of our current monetary system, our currency, is that it's, it's, it really can be measurable. 
But when it comes to the human experience and the things that really make life worth living, that can often be a little bit vague. Uh, and unfortunately, some companies do use that um, ambiguity to get away with some really gnarly greenwashing and the like, and they throw around the, the words impact and uh, don't really mean it. And so we have this challenge of also making sure that we're not doing the same thing. So we say impact, but what is impact? I mean, you can have positive impact or negative impact, right? And what we, I think at DuContra, we're very, um, I, like to, I like to think we're very mature uh, and about how we are the word and we're not sort of um, uh, na- naively uh, Pollyanna about it, you know? We really want to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture and understanding the trade-offs. You know, not everything is going to be absolutely perfect. There is no absolute panacea or solution to any one problem. And anything we do is going to have some impact, both good and maybe some bad. So we have to really find that balance. But when you look at tools like seeds, they're actually able to start to tweak and drill down into the minutia and the details of, of those levers so that we really can get a, a more accurate picture of what impact means. So these c- companies are really helpful to us um, because we like to remain relatively agnostic and, and hands off and say, look, we don't know exactly what impact is. We want to empower people, uh, give people the, the chance to decide in a, in a sovereign way, what impact is so that they can apply their money in that way. If we start to dictate it, you know, nobody has one right answer. So um, these kinds of tools empower the individual to actually make those, those choices and then help to give the tools to, to put a little color to what impact really means or, and what ESG really is. Other than just seeds, what are some other companies that can, might be able to give us some color that you guys have invested in at DuContra? Uh, yeah, so we have four verticals. One, as I mentioned, future of finance. One is um, communitas, so tools that bring people together, uh, businesses that allow people to commune and and and, and work together, um, and then human flourishing, which is the up leveling of the individual. So tools of health, wellness, mental health, so that you know individuals can be at their optimal performance so they can make the most sense of the wor- world and make the best decisions and then do consumer our consumer goods. So what we consume and how. So across all of those four verticals, we think that we can actually empower people to be their best, uh, do what humans do that is different from all other animals, which is work together, collaborate uh, and, and work on things together. And then be a little bit more responsible of what they consume and how, and then most importantly, the tool of money, making sure that we get that right so that they have the tools they need, the access they need to that, that cash to go do the good, good work. Zach, what are the questions that investors interested in aligning their personal values and financial goals should ask their financial advisors? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, the sort of macro answer is to ask your advisor or really ask yourself, you know, why, why hasn't this been put in front of me yet? Why isn't this part of sort of the default experience? Um, you know, when we think of what we're trying to solve for, for the financial advisor, it's as we've talked about, how do you frame up this conversation? So you you feel empowered to go through an assessment process with that, you know, end investor really understand who they are and then give them the right portfolio solution that aligns. And our thesis is, again, that should be a default conversation that you're having. And so, you know, if you have an existing advisor and that first meeting it, um, was sort of agnostic of values and was still just about, hey, what's your risk tolerance and your time horizon? And here's your sort of model basket of ETFs and mutual funds that you're going to pay me to manage. Um, I think that paradigm is is going to shift dramatically, right? And so I think as the investor thinking about, hey, shouldn't shouldn't my advisor maybe be asking me these things and understanding me in this way uh, more deeply than than arguably they have before? So getting past that point, right? So assuming that the advisor 
uh, has engaged in that conversation to begin with. I think, you know, understanding as the investor, again, that sort of alignment across values, what the advisor can do um, as they understand who you are, understanding as the investor, if I'm doing this over here with charitable giving, I'm making impact investments, how do I sort of see and understand the collective impact across all of those sort of buckets of money? And so asking of your advisor to sort of shape that story for you, to really more deeply understand what you own today, right? So that's part of the first part. What do you own today and where can I go in a long-term portfolio? And then how does that long-term portfolio, again, align with everything else that hopefully the advisor is supporting you in doing from a values perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I, I really resonate with that. Um, I see this as, you know, from a storytelling perspective, from a filmmaking perspective, you know, each, each business you invest in is a plot point on a story and what story are you telling? And so in many ways, uh, giving the financial advisors the opportunity to start to articulate and communicate that story um, in a way that an, an investor can see, oh, I'm not just arbitrarily randomly investing in businesses to make money, but I'm actually telling a story with where my money is going and how that actually plays out in the real world. It's the ultimate story ever told. It's our lives <laughs> that are unfolding um, before us. So yeah, I, that, I respond to that. I would just add to that, you know, that story, if you can tell that story as the financial advisor, what that means for you in differentiating your value proposition is massive, right? Because again, if it was about, I'm just going to understand these sort of financial metrics about you, your risk tolerance and your time horizon. And then my value proposition is to give you a portfolio that arguably that, you know, millennial investor could go open on a robo platform. For, for maybe even a, a smaller cost, you need to reshape the value proposition around, I'm actually going to more deeply understand you in a way that a robo platform never could, and then create this story around that, right? And then that story and your understanding of that person is at the center of the relationship forever. When you go into those review meetings as an advisor, it's not just, hey, what has the performance been versus benchmarks? Because I'm the smart at, smartest asset man manager on the planet. It's more about, hey, remember when we built this thing together because I really understand who you are and what makes you tick as an investor. And here's how, here's the impact we're creating together and how this thing remains in alignment with who you are. So creating that story and delivering that story is, is I think, fundamental for advisors going forward. Have you found, Zach, that there's a lot of people who historically haven't connected the importance of money and doing things that historically people haven't considered take money. So I, well, being in the position that I've been, I've talked to a lot of people about money and I've come across quite a few people who say that they don't care about money. You know, they think, you know, I don't, I don't care about money. I don't need money. I don't need to invest, et cetera. And then we start talking and I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just having conversations with these people as my friends or even family members or people that have just been in my life. And they're like, you know, I don't care about money. And then we start talking about the things they do care about. Just one example is somebody wanted to open like a, a shelter for dogs. And I'm like, I, that's a great mission goal, you know, whatever you want to call it. But how are you going to do that without money? Like you, I understand you don't care about the money itself, but you need money to actually open that dog shelter or whatever it is you want to do. So do you find there's a lot of people that you're trying to help see and connect the dots between their more philanthropic adventures and their investment goals? Yeah, I, I love that question because I think what they're communicating when they say that they don't care about money is they don't like all the negative aspects that come with money, right? And all the problems that, that can be generated from, from money in so many different ways, obviously. And, and again, going back to the value proposition for a financial advisor to literally reshape the definition of money right, for that investor client and for them to better understand how they can feel empowered to use money as a tool and to sort of, you know, push away those, those negative issues that they're coming to the table with and have them understand that, no, this is about if you sort of have, if we can map out a game plan together around who you are and what matters to you, all those things, Robert, you just mentioned, then, then we can make it happen. And money happens to be 
part of you know how how we solve for that. But we think about it through the lens of it being a tool as opposed to this just sort of mechanism for transactions, right? It's a thing for um, for us to to empower us in the things we want to accomplish. But it goes back to that blueprint, right? Understanding who that person is, the legacy that they want to create, what's most important to them, and then you reshape the definition of money and and becomes useful and hopefully not uh, as detrimental as it can be for for all the reasons we know. Adrian, what did you set as your goal with your investment in seeds? What would you consider as an inv- a success for this type of investment for your fund? Well, you know, we do have our our investors to look out for as well, and you know, they they want to see good returns. Um, you know, we have a pretty good track record, um, but for us, it's it's this is a long term relationship by nature. So, you know, over the next eight to 10, 10 years, you know, we want to see seeds grow healthy. And, uh, you know, of course we want to make our money back and then some, um, and frankly, we'd love to be able to reinvest, uh, and help with their growth. Uh, we're, we're not in it for a short-term gain. We're, we're not looking to, um, pump and dump, so to speak. You know, we, we understand that uh, entrepreneurs that mean it are in it, you know, for the long term and have to, they need the support to overcome, you know, many of the, many of the challenges that entrepreneurs have to face when they're starting a business and they're, and they're growing. So um, success for us is uh, obviously a healthy return, but, but most importantly, uh, being able to support our, our entrepreneurs. How do you guys make sure that your goals are aligned? I think you probably have the same incentive structure, but you might not necessarily have the exact same goals, whether it's from the entrepreneur's perspective and the investor's perspective. So how do you guys ensure that the company's goals, Seed's goals, are aligned with that of the investor, such as DuContra and and maybe other investors that there are? How do you make sure that everything is aligned? Don't sell out, Zach. Yeah, that's it. You know, that's the answer. I think uh, it goes back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier in that North Star alignment. So, you know, you're never going to have perfect symmetry in, you know, perfect alignment from an incentives perspective. We hope to not be in in business relationships, um, you know, uh, have an economic structure like the, the one we're seeing play out with Facebook. So we hope to be, you know, much further away on the spectrum, you know, toward, toward alignment, but it goes back to, again, that North star. So, um, the, you know, DuContra as a venture platform is e- extremely hands-on and supportive in the day-to-day and how we're going to build this business and sort of the, in the weeds elements of, of what we're doing. Um, but if you're not aligned in what is this bigger picture goal, which of course includes the return. So we're certainly on the same page when it comes to that and, and the financial success we want to have with this business uh, over many, many years. Uh, but if you're not aligned with that bigger picture, you, you create friction you know, with that more day-to-day discussion. So you know, in my opinion, this is, you know, again, there's always, there's never going to be perfect symmetry, but, but it's a pretty incredible relationship where philosophically we're on the same page from a business perspective, we are very much on the same page in what we're building and the paradigm we're trying to change. And obviously the, you know, the returns uh, that we're trying to create together. So um, I, you know, I really couldn't ask for better uh, symmetry. Yeah. And and look, I don't want to get too woo woo, but there is an instinct and a feel like you, you, you meet people and you get to know them and it's, it's not all, you know, it's sometimes you just have to make a gut decision about who you trust. And these are the people you're going to be working with for a long time. Uh, and, and we reserve the right to work with people we like. I mean, that's, that, that's part of it too. You know I mean? You want to, you want to find a job that you enjoy so you don't have to work a day in your life as they say. And also surround yourself with people that you admire, that you trust, and that you believe are, are not going to stab you in the back and they're going to actually do what they say. Um, and a lot of that is, is instinctive. 
A lot of that is is feel, uh, and and don't discount that. You know, you work with a lot of stiff sometimes, and there's something that you just don't trust about them. And I think life is too short. One of the problems that I have with podcast is that too often times people just listen to content and they just keep churning through it and they just go on to their next episode. And I think education and learning about everything we've talked about today is super important, but I think actually taking action on what you're learning is even more important. So I created a segment of the show called the action plan where I ask the guests three questions to give everybody listening to the show, three things to go do when they're done with this episode. So the first question for you both is, what is a habit or principle that you follow in your life that you think has had a big impact on your success that not enough people do, but should? I have a simple one. It's not too complicated, although implementing it, as with anything, can be a struggle. But uh, getting more sleep is is a simple habit that I've been trying to implement myself. A little bit of a struggle when you have a four and one year old um, and and are running a startup. But you know, just trying to take care of yourself. Uh, and I think sleep, you know, reading about sleep more and more and, and how important it is and to, to be able to get up every morning and actually go implement all the things that are kind of rattling around in your brain. Um, and I think it's one of those things that strangely people discount and, and you know, cut short every day. Um, so a little bit of a random answer. But that's my answer. Not random at all. But uh, closely re- related to mine, which was going to be meditation, um, uh, just taking taking the time to reflect. You know, sometimes you get in in the rhythm of things, and you know it's hard to stop, and you you forget what you're not not look not seeing. Right? You may not notice uh, a, a solution or an opportunity that you're driving past. So. Um, Take the time to, to, to really observe. And, and as I was saying before, like I, I'm accessible because there are so many opportunities out there that will benefit me. You know, so sometimes people can get ahead of themselves and, you know, ignore, ignore the little people because they don't at first glance don't seem to have an opportunity. But when you take a step back, you pause, you meditate, you start to see, wow, there's, there's some opportunities that are like ahead of the curve that I could probably get involved in. And, um, there's a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I speak, to, I, I talk to literally, you know, I, 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 I speak to a lot of diplomats, a lot of celebrities, a lot of, you know, people with stature, but it's, it's the people that, you know, you meet on the street or, or, you know, at a, a bar that, you know, often bring a lot of um, value to my life. So there you go, everybody listening. There's two habits that you can implement. Get more sleep and practice meditation. For the next one, Adrian and Zach, what has been the most influential book in your life? And I always like to distinguish, it doesn't necessarily have to be your favorite. I think there's a difference between your favorite and what has maybe had the most impact on you. So what has had the most impact? Uh, I mentioned it before and I'll just say it again. Uh Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein, and that's relevant to this conversation. It helps shape my thinking uh, around the creation of DuContra and and how we've approached finances and impact and investing. So uh, check that out, especially if you're if you're working in money. Any, anybody who deals with money, which is 100% of us, um, have a read. Yeah, my answer, I mean, sort of general answer. I don't have a specific book title. Um, but I was thinking about, uh, I've read a lot of books and I've spent a lot of time trying to become a better writer, which again, may sound a bit random, but I think, um, you know, we've sort of discounted the, the importance of the written word when, you know, we're, we're just dropping it down to how many characters are in a tweet and that's the way we communicate with each other. And I think, you know, writing well is a bit of a lost art. And, and if you master it, it translates into a lot of powerful things, uh, you know, within a business and, and how you communicate what you're doing as a business and how you communicate with your team and the outside world. Uh, so, yeah, pick up a book on, uh, on how to write a bit better than maybe you do today. When this episode is over, other than implementing the habit that we talked about and those two books... 
What is one action that somebody listening to the show should take to improve their life, career, or business? I'll take it back to you know what we're trying to do with values aligned investing. I would say kind of do a gut check on what, what do you own? Do you really have clarity on where your money is? And I think arguably most people don't. So they know what they're doing. Again, they're nonprofit giving and these proactive things, but in these sort of passive long-term portfolios, you know, we see investors who care about criminal justice issues, for example. And then you know, if you own a broad index ETF and you own private prison companies that are in business to put and keep people in prison. So you're out in the world, you know, stressing about very important values related issues. And, and I think often sort of unwittingly doing the opposite in your portfolio. So I, I think the, the core takeaway to that is, and, and Adrian speaks to this often, and it's important, this is a way to reduce your stress as it relates to what you worry about in the world. In other words, doing, you know, having values alignment in your portfolio is arguably the easiest, most passive thing you can do that arguably at scale as other investors do it will have the largest effect. So, you know, we, I worry about when I forget to recycle something, right? But knowing that, you know, I, I can make sure that my money is, is doing uh, what I need it to do can sort of reduce that overall stress about what's going on in the world and, and what I care about. So, yeah, so that's the takeaway. Gut check, what do I own? And yeah, go, go sort of knock on your financial advisor's door or, you know, look yourself, look at it yourself and, uh, and try to assess that. I would say take a permaculture. Um, changed my life and highly recommend it. There are uh, principles within permaculture and uh, whole systems thinking, design theory, where that will, will help you in all aspects of your life. Not just if you're, you know, a farmer or building a garden, uh, but if, if you're doing anything, really how, how you manage teams, how you manage a business, uh, how, how you cu cultivate resiliency within your business. Um, I, I highly recommend taking a permaculture course. Before we give a handoff to where people can find you both, I would like to wrap up the show by turning the tables and letting the guest ask me a question. Instead of me just asking all the questions the whole time, I like to let the guest ask me something. So since we have two of you today, you can both ask me a question. What question do you guys have for me? Gel or mousse? I don't know the difference. I just picked a can that looks good and I go with it. Um, I'm just teasing. For, for all you um, podcast listeners, you can't see, we have great hair in this crew. <laughs> that was the, good. the only problem with my hair is I'm balding, but Medium shine, medium hold is what I go for. <laughs> go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I, I would ask you, you know, as you think about your audience, you know, sort of that core, uh, my generation, millennial generation, um, what do you see as, as you talk to these types of investors as maybe being a roadblock or a bit of a hindrance to wrapping their heads around this idea of values alignment in portfolios. So the ability to kind of bring to life all the things we've been talking about today, what's that, what's that first hurdle you see when you go into conversations with people? I really haven't found much of a hurdle at all. I think our generation and even generations behind us, Gen Zs, typically what they're called, they and we seem to be a lot more accepting of it. When I first, I'm only 26, so I'm super young still or relatively. But when I first started studying investing when I was like 14, 15, you never heard anything about impact investing or ESG. Like it was very, very minimal. And now tons of people reach out to me all the time talking about how they want to make sure their investments are aligned with their values. And you hear about it on social media and you hear about it on the news and you hear about it all over the place. So I really don't think there's much of a hurdle for millennials and Gen Z who are trying to align their values with their investing. Now, if I did have to pick one, I think the one thing I do hear is, and this is more from people I think they're a little bit more educated on investing rather than just completely beginners, but 
sometimes they have a hesitation towards returns. You know, they, they want to invest in a way that is aligned with their values, but they don't want to sacrifice returns. They understand compound interest and they understand how important that is. So they don't want to sacrifice that in order to just buy companies that are aligned with what they see as the right way to view the world. So I think if I had to pick one, I would say it's that, but I don't think it's a major, major issue for millennials, new investors, Gen Z investors. And if I could speak to the returns question, because of course, you know, that that is sort of the answer, right? That's that's what you hear as maybe hopefully the only hurdle. And and we think of it as, you know, what people have anchored in as the conventional wisdom that there is this required give up, right? You, you, you're not going to be able to reach the same returns if you want to bring values into your portfolio. And what's interesting as the industry has evolved is, is now it's really the opposite, right? This is now a framework to assess companies through a different lens that still comes down to fundamental analysis of companies, right? In other words, if you're terrible to your workforce or you make a product that hurts the consumer. As a pragmatic investor, I would hesitate to invest in that company, agnostic of values. But I, if I also care about people, right, and I want to make sure that companies are behaving appropriately as it relates to the product that they make and, the, and how they treat their workforce, well, then, hey, I get that too. Right. So, the, so that, um, you know, there's an investment thesis now behind assessing companies through this lens. And we just have this incredible secondary benefit of how it can, at the same time, align with what you care about. So appreciate that answer, because I think hopefully uh, we can reshape that a bit as people better understand that that was the conventional wisdom. And fortunately, we're kind of breaking through that uh, going forward. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We're seeing the gap close between companies that are purely profit-driven and those who have a bigger mission. And Starbucks is a good example of that, I think. You know, there's a lot of research that's coming out too that's showing companies that take better care of their employees and provide better benefits and things like that actually can provide even outsized returns because the company ends up performing better. So I think we're closing that gap in terms of people's concerns of investing in companies that are doing good and also achieving uh, satisfactory returns. So thank you both for joining me on the show today. Zach, where can people go to learn more about you and Seeds? And Adrian, where can the audience go to connect with you, learn more about yourself, and also do Contra Ventures? So like I found Adrian, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Love to talk about people, you know, how they think about this industry and, and the future of investing. Uh, and in terms of what we're doing with Seeds, come find us just at our website, seedsinvestor.com. And uh, yeah, love to talk. Yeah, I, I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, of course, Instagram at Adrian Grenier and, uh, and then do Contra dot ventures, uh, uh, is, is our, well, it's at do Contra dot ventures as well as do Contra dot ventures, www dot do Contra dot ventures, um, as a website. So check us out. I will be sure to put links to both of their resources and some of the other resources, some of the books that we talked about throughout the show in the show notes below for anybody that's interested in checking those out. Guys, thank you both so much for joining me. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. See ya. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.